I would like now to welcome Hannah Landegger. And uh, Hannah sits in Los Angeles. It's uh, morning hours in Los Angeles. Hannah, welcome and uh, good morning. Uh, good to see you. And uh, thank you very much for joining us in that, in that uh, seminar series here. Before Hannah starts giving her talk, I would um, like to introduce her. Uh, Hannah is a historian and a sociologist uh, of the life sciences. She holds a joint appointment uh, in the life and the social sciences at the University of California in uh, Los Angeles, where she's a professor in the Department of Sociology and the director of the Institute in Society and Genetics. Obviously a very interdisciplinary unit um, at uh, UCLA. She received her PhD at the MIT in a program in science, technology, and society. And uh, her work focuses on the social and the historical study of biotechnology and life sciences from 1900 on to now. She studies the intersections of biology and technology with a particular focus on cells and the in vitro conditions of life in research settings. She's currently working on something which she calls the American metabolism, which looks at transformations of uh, the metabolic sciences wrought by the, the, uh, the rise of um, epigenetics, uh, microbiomics, cell signaling, hormone biology, etc. Her uh, previous uh, publications include a book called Culturing Life, How Cells Become Technologies, and many different articles uh, and subjects from antibiotic resistance to micro cinematography. Hannah will now talk to us about the microbiome after industrialization, the biology and history of, of arsenic and temporal spatial integrity. Hannah, the floor is yours. You have to share the screen now and we are very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you for joining us. So I guess I'm going to be uh, making the argument that every institution needs a historian as well. Um, and uh, we, I will share my screen here. So uh, as you can tell from, from the picture here, um, I don't have uh, an organism on my opening slide, but there is quite a possibility that there is an organism within those um, uh, industrial zones. One of the things that we've done uh, over the last 150 years is to uh, industrialize metabolism, but in particular to industrialize uh, um, the, the metabolism of microbes and to uh, augment and suppress and join it with uh, human, animal, and plant metabolism in new ways. So the premise of my talk, therefore, uh, to sort of draw it away from some of the, these questions of nature and evolution and, and uh, basic definitions is really to say that any of these entities, um, any microbiome, any individual, any meta-organism, any microbial human metabolic community is today living in a world shaped uh, by, profoundly shaped by human social history. And I, need, I mean that uh, both in terms of the norms and habits and behaviors and the way that we live in relation to one another um, uh, socially, but I also mean very materially the nutrient, toxin, chemical, biochemical landscape has become a fundamentally uh, anthropogenic one. And I think that uh, uh, our, our biologists need to take account of this and our historians also, um, who are perhaps used to writing histories of biology uh, should also be paying attention to these biologies of history. So what's on the menu today? Um, I'm going to uh, talk a bit about the history of metabolism exactly in order to illustrate how it was not just a history of concepts, but a very material history that has fed into the industrialization of metabolism. Arsenic here is my example. It's not the only one that could be given. It just helps me con connect this to um, uh, questions of contemporary biology, where we are coping with some of the consequences of uh, the 19th and 20th century industrialization of metabolism, 
and thinking about uh, metabolic disorder. So thinking about metabolic order and disorder in relation to the microbiome, arsenic is a good example of that. So I'm gonna talk about industrialization as a kind of metabolic deterritorialization in the microbiome. Okay, so let's just get started. I'm gonna fly through you know, a century of history in about five minutes. So I, my apologies to any uh, real historians in the audience, um, but uh, we should just lay down some bases here. Metabolism as a scientific concept you may know was coined in the 19th century as part of the articulation of cell theory. It was Theodore Schwann who in 1839 put forward this idea that cells possessed a metabolic power, the ability to chemically change substances within themselves or in their immediate surrounds. He took the word from the Greek metabole, previously used to describe the transposition of music from one key to another. In the latter half of the 20th century, the concept came to encompass both physiologist Claude Bernard's idea of nutrition and the function of the milieu interior in transforming the exterior world into an interior one. This is my favorite quote from Bernard's work. The dog does not get fat on mutton fat, it makes dog fat. So this encapsulates this idea, right, that the function of the inside of the organism was to uh, convert, to chemically convert what it took in into itself. So here we have one of the foundations, I think, of uh, modern scientific views of individuality and freedom to move through the environment because of this chemical power to convert everything ingested into the self. Um, Justice von Liebig also, of course, was very important. Uh, he had this combustion uh, chemistry-based concept of Stoffwechsel as an internal chemical transformation. Um, so, of course, for Bernard, the idea of the nutritive reserve was foundational to understanding the integrity and freedom of the individual vis-a-vis -vis the environment. And Liebig, too, articulated what I would call a similar logic of total conversion, this kind of combustive inner chemical conversion process um, that was the basis of life. So while these men were bitter critics of uh, one another in the time, they left uh, a joint conceptual legacy whose material consequences continue to resonate um, to our present day. Um, this logic of total conversion, that is that anything ingested uh, was transformed on the inside. This is how we get this idea of uh, food as fuel, food as building blocks. Um, a, a machinic body with combustive qualities comes to us, especially from uh, the German uh, tradition of input-output physiology. Um, so we see the body as a machine that uses food as fuel and nutrition as building blocks with this marked division between inside and outside. And perhaps um, also a kind of hierarchical relation develops in the 20th century between historical genetic functions and nutritive metabolic functions. So this is sort of the conceptual ground on which uh, newer ideas are now pushing back at some of these things. So we can see these legacies in early 20th century depictions of the body, such as this famous illustration by Fritz Kahn of man as a chemical factory with capital ex executives in the brain directing the disassembly and reassembly of work in the organs. Um, or in the um, very formulation of the task of the discipline of biochemistry, which JBS Haldane famously articulated in 1937 as a complete account of intermediary metabolism, that is to say of the transformations undergone by matter in passing through organisms. Note here that the organism is an agent that acts on the matter passing through it. And I would say that, that the matter uh, passing through organisms was markedly uh, without agency in, in these frameworks. Okay, so this lays the conceptual ground for something um, which was not just uh, a set of ideas floating above uh, the landscape. It was not just a nice metaphor, but became the grounds for metabolism as a technical object of engineering. 
and particularly in, in uh, the food production uh, and agriculture sectors. The picture on the right there um, is, is uh, you may not be able to tell, is actually uh, the depiction of the inside of a cow. Um, the animal as a converter of matter and energy um, was the basis for uh, much uh, effort to, uh, to, to improve uh, productivity and while we often speak of the industrialization of agriculture or the industrialization of food production, I think it's fundamental that we actually have an empirical grasp on the history and the biology of uh, the industrialization of metabolism itself. This is how the historical actors at the time experienced what they were doing in the establishment of a science of, um, uh, of accelerated growth. Here we have a chemical company representative from the mid 50s speaking about the ability of trace amounts of arsenic based medications as growth promoters. He says a growth promoter need not be an essential metabolite. It may, for example, speed up or slow down advantageously a critical metabolic process. He speaks of foods as combinations of fuel and raw materials, which must in our present ignorance be processed in the digestive tracts of our animals in order to obtain the products we're after. He says, we have passed the point at which only so-called natural feed materials rate consideration as feed ingredients. A modern feed may owe its efficiency to the incorporated counterparts of the catalysts, lubricants and anti-knock agents of modern fuels. So I'll get to uh, telling you why arsenical medications were a growth promoter in a minute, but you can see that it was not an idle logic to uh, draw an analogy between uh, anti-knock agents and uh, antibiotics and uh, arsenicals as, as uh, growth promoters because they were quite literally being made um, by the same uh, uh, chemical industries at, at that time. You may well ask who ever thought it was a good idea to put arsenic in the food supply, um, but it comes uh, that way actually through uh, pharma pharmaceuticals. Arsenic, of course, occurs naturally um, in, in, in rock and in groundwater, uh, but it was first used pharmaceutically in the early 20th century as the basis of salversan, the first widely used chemotherapeutic agent to treat syphilis. Um, arsenic is, of course, a transitional element, meaning it can form alloys uh, with uh, other metals, but also with carbon. And when it, uh, an arsenic atom is bound, bonded to carbon in a compound, it is an organoarsenic. And organic arsenic compounds are much less toxic to humans than inorganic ones. And thus were the basis of this uh, first famous uh, 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 magic uh, bullet uh, drug. As I noted, arsenic can also bond to metals, in particular copper, lead, and gold. And unprocessed uh, copper ore um, contains about three, between three and 11% um, percent arsenic. In the United States, although elsewhere in the world as well, um, the copper smelting business was uh, supplemented uh, with the business of byproduct uh, recovery, which was to recover uh, inorganic arsenic from this copper smelting smoke. Uh, you can see here uh, 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 an article from, from Tacoma on the, on the West Coast about this. By about um, uh, 1912, calcium and lead arsenate pesticides were being marketed for the control of codling moth in the Northwest apple crops. And as you can see in the picture in the right, ball weevil in Southern copper crops. By 1944, about 86 million pounds of lead arsenate and 42 million pounds of calcium arsenate were being applied to crops annually for insect control. Interestingly, these agents were also used in citrus growing as a growth regulator to accelerate the maturity of grapefruit in increasing um, the sugar acid ratio. The advent of DDT and concern about consumer poisoning by these pesticides meant um, that lead arsenate went uh, out of um, production around uh, the time of World War II, but a new and lucrative market was appearing in the area of animal husbandry. 
With the introduction of vitamin D in the late 1920s, chicken growers were able to move chickens indoors and grow them year round. And this intensification led to a, a great deal of outbreak of parasitical diseases, which took investigators' minds back to Ehrlich's successes uh, with Salversan and led to um, the development of arsenicals that could be put in drinking water. And so uh, low dose arsenicals in drinking water and in food uh, also turned out fortuitously to the mind of the farmers um, to be a growth promoter. It pr produced faster maturation, which meant birds could become layers or be slaughtered earlier and increased weight gain, lowering feed costs in uh, relation to sale weight. Also interesting from a metabolic perspective, um, these low-dose arsenicals made the meat pinker, which made it look better to consumers. So this story is just one small part of the larger rise of uh, a medicated feed industry, replacing farm-grown inputs uh, in the name of science, productivity, and feed efficiency. Uh, this is an ad from Dow Chemical that says, peep, cackle, oink, moo. If it makes a sound like any of these, then we have the feed additive to keep it healthy and profitable. And the Zoomix here that you uh, see in the picture is an, uh, a sack of the arsenical, uh, arsenical medications against um, intestinal parasites. So by the 60s, the use of arsenicals in feed in uh, the United States and many other countries, although not in Europe, uh, was ubiquitous. Even though antibiotics turned out to be also effective growth promoters, arsenicals were simply added to antibiotics because they targeted different parasites and had this unparalleled cosmetic pinkening benefit. Okay, so I'm going to uh, pause on this story of arsenic uh, in medicated feed and, and get back to it. Um, it's hard as a historian to, to uh, exit this, this paradise of animal feed advertising and the kind of social history that one gives there. But this is where I'm going to do my move, which is to say, ask the question, how can this kind of let's say, social history of uh, agricultural science uh, lead us perhaps to ask different kinds of biological questions in the present? How can it uh, uh, give us insights into the sense that the biologies that we are working on as scientists or experiencing as living beings, um, how, are they, how are they shaped by these kinds of histories? So this is the, the second part where I'm going to um, uh, juxtapose this a bit with some contemporary, uh, contemporary thinking about microbiomes and metabolism, and in particular, uh, the organization of those things in space and time. So metabolism went through a bit of a fallow period in the 20th century. Um, uh, in the wake of an information model of life and a shift in focus to genes and cellular signals, such as hormones and cytokines. However, with the seismic shifts in life expectancy that we've seen and the rise in prevalence of chronic disease, both fueled um, by, in part by this nutrition transition enabled by the developments I've just been speaking about, with all of those changes has come renewed interest in understanding not just metabolic order, but metabolic disorder. And so what I wanna do in the second part of the talk is to switch from this historical mode uh, and into the contemporary and talk about um, moves away from those flat, endlessly cyclical images of an enormous input output factory of metabolism to a clearer picture of metabolic interactions that happen in time and space organized in very particular ways. So you may at this point be wondering if I'm actually ever going to talk about the microbiome, but I am actually getting there. So I'm gonna draw these threads of past and present arsenic and metabolism together actually at the gut wall. But before I do that, I need to follow out one more substantive thread and explain um, this area of uh, theorization um, around metabolic compartmentalization. So what is metabolic compartmentalization? Uh, this is a very abstract representation of the principles um, behind 
why uh, different uh, components of metabolic processes are separated by membranes um, or by time or uh, by, by molecular sequestration. So put most simply, when you have a sequence of chemical reactions, you often need to uh, keep apart uh, the products and the, the substrates. Sometimes reactions are sequestered and kept apart by one another by an arrangement of protein scaffolds or a clustering of the enzymes that carry out a reaction in the cell. Sometimes there's a membrane keeping one thing apart from another. And sometimes specific conditions are needed for a, a, a reaction, an enzymatic reaction to happen. So in peroxisomes, for example, pH is more acidic than other parts of the cell. And this is appropriate to the reactions that happen inside it, but not to the whole cell. Some metabolic sequences create toxic intermediates that one really doesn't want getting around. Um, and other times uh, you just don't want the intermediates diffusing away in cellular space before the next reaction can happen. You can get what are uh, called futile cycles in that substrates and products of different reactions get mixed up. And so the cell is futilely interconverting chemicals in competing directions. So in short, we see a, a structural and uh, we see structural and temporal components of all kinds um, that that structure the the sets of of interactions that compose um, metabolism. There are, of course, lots of scales of um, compartmentalization. Although um, uh, many of the analyses of these uh, are, are uh, focused on thinking about compartmentalization uh, inside cells, but of course uh, we will get to speaking about uh, a very important compartmentalization, which is, which is that of the gut. So both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells use te these techniques of sequestration and concentration and temporal parsing to order metabolic reactions. Um, but of course, there are these, these, these many, many uh, scales. Additionally, metabolic compartmentalization is not just a property of the insides of individuals, but can be a feature of metabolic communities composed of, of many individual cells. Don't be too misled by compartmentalization. Um, it's not necessarily the best phrase because it is about keeping things apart, but it is also about intentional uh, ordering of transit across uh, these, these boundaries. A 2015 paper on biofilms il illustrates uh, these ideas really nicely. The Sewell lab at UC San Diego used microfluidics and time-lapse micro microscopy to observe growing biofilms. Biofilms, of course, as you well know, um, are a challenge in terms of antibiotic resistance and chemical control because it's hard to get at the cells in the middle. Um, the ones on the outside may be uh, uh, protecting the ones in the middle. The researchers discovered that when the biofilms they were growing in their microfluidic devices reached a certain size, they began to oscillate in their growth, pulling back and growing, pulling back and growing. And they theorized that oscillating growth is a manifestation of what they call metabolic codependence, a relationship organized spatially, but also temporally within the biofilm. The interior cells produce a metabolite necessary for the growth of the bacteria on the outside. This provides the inner cells with the ability to periodically slow the growth of the outer cells, which otherwise would consume all the available nutrients and starve the cells on the interior. So by periodically preventing the growth on the periphery, inner cells ensure they have enough to eat, yet at the same time, by keeping the protected inner cells alive, the biofilm has this much higher collective chance of surviving external stressors, such as antibiotics or disinfectants. As I said, the intestinal wall is also an amazing example of this importance of spatial, but also temporal organization. It's both a barrier and a zone of transduction, but of course, not necessarily something that we are used to thinking of as temporally organized. Perhaps surprisingly, the epithelial lining uh, of the intestine is sometimes called the body's largest endocrine organ, 
because about 1% of the cells in it have an endocrine function, sensing nutrients and bacterial signals and transducing them by secreting hormones and cell signaling molecules that affect satiety and appetite and nausea and even bodily assessments of the volume and amino acid content of ingested food. And of course, I don't need to tell this audience that the relationship between commensal microbes and intestinal epithelial cells um, seems to be dedicated at least in part to maintaining the integrity of the barrier between them, the, the barrier that constitutes the together but carefully bounded structure of commensality. Many studies have now highlighted paradoxically that gut integrity is a continuous process of interlocution between ingested food, microbes, and bodily cells. It's not that the human and the microbe dissolve into one big undifferentiated metabolic community or network, but that boundedness is actually one of the things that is constantly in process, constantly the work of metabolic interaction. So boundedness and compartmentalized, com compartmentalized organization is itself an important outcome of interspecies uh, interaction. So here's where we draw all these pieces together. So I'm now going to return to the scene of uh, industrialization um, of metabolism. While arsenicals as growth promoters have now been phased out in the United States as of 2015 and were never really used in Europe, um, the broader point is that low-dose chronic exposure to industrial toxicants has become a feature of contemporary biology. We all live with the legacy of widespread use of things such as arsenical pesticides and wood preservatives. We all live uh, in the wake of the so-called liberation of arsenic from rock through smelting and mining, and the well-known unintended consequences of well drilling modernization projects, as well as the perhaps underestimated global impacts of arsenic in warfare, both as poisons and as defoliants. And it is now well established that arsenic has carcin carcinogenic features at high doses. But interestingly, there's also an emerging consensus that chronic low-dose exposure to, to arsenic uh, in its different species forms is a metabolic disruptor and a risk factor for diabetes and, and obesity. So quite a few investigators are trying to tease out this complex biology of arsenic, which could be its own talk 40 times over. Um, but it is at least very clear that the microbiome is an important mediator of these impacts of uh, chronic arsenic exposure or ingestion on physiology. So experimental modeling comparing arsenic exposure paired with a, a Western diet, high in fat and sugar and low in fiber, um, showed that uh, a high fiber normal uh, mouse chow diet in these, these uh, animals um, was, uh, was, was protective uh, against the exposure to, to arsenic. So lack of dietary fiber reduced microbial diversity and animals um, uh, treated together with arsenic in a Western diet showed more severe physiological damage from the same amount of, of ingested arsenic. So in other words, a high fat, low fiber diet acted synergistically with arsenic exposure in um, causing physiological damage. And I might just point out that uh, the Western diet uh, came to us in part through using things like arsenicals as, as, as growth promoters. Um, so the study of the microbiome as this kind of intermediary uh, in uh, coping with xenobiotic chemicals is a very large field um, within which very interesting um, findings about uh, what happens to the microbiome with, with arsenic exposure are happening. John Stoltz at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, um, uh, unsatisfied with studies that simply made correlations between arsenic and microbiome changes, wanted to show what happens to the microbes living in the gut wall, in the colonic mucosa, under conditions of low-dose uh, chronic arsenic ingestion. 
So these electron micrographs um, from this paper show that arsenic exposure at quite low uh, environmentally relevant doses in uh, experimental mouse models changed the community structure and physical character of the mucosal lining of the mouse colon over 10 weeks in this, in this time, in this experiment. They saw changes in the species profile of the microbes found there, but importantly, the very architecture of the human epithelial cell microbe relationship was altered. The character of the intestinal lining changed in that investigators saw the loss of the small coccoids that are characteristic of the microbial layer found closest to the intestinal epithelium. They saw extensive sporulation of firmicutes by five weeks of exposure and loss of biofilm st structure accompanied by the new presence of filamentous bacteria by 10 weeks. So they saw all kinds of spatial and structural changes that again were accompanied by functional changes in nitrogen and amino acid metabolism. So in this study, the microbiome is both a buffer against arsenic exposure, but eventually uh, is itself re-territorialized by it. So in the modernist formulations of the early 20th century that I spoke about earlier, matter moved through the organism. Microbial metabolism was seen as a site of industrial productivity for moving even more matter through more organisms. It was, as many theorists and historians have elaborated, a kind of dream of speed, of obliterating the limits of space and time. Through using microbial metabolism, humans scaled up the manufacture of nutrients such as B12 and antibiotics, but also used many uh, toxicants as adjuvants to move them through the landscape in these highly intentional streams of nutrients and growth promoters. So it's my sense that to understand some of the unintended metabolic disorder that this has caused, we need to understand these previous forms of metabolic industrialization as fundamental ruptures in the spatio-temporal organization of food webs and metabolic communities from the smallest to the largest scales. So this is not just about space or volume of these uh, these, these uh, biochemical landscapes that all microbiomes live in, but it is importantly also always about temporality. So the current inter intersection of an, an infectious disease pandemic and a chronic disease epidemic in which socioeconomic disparities in diabetes and obesity are driving hugely, hugely disparate impacts makes this task even more urgent and more important. So I think that I've used the example of arsenic, but you could equally take uh, this analysis that I've just run through with it and equally perform it with something like shift work, asking how the social organization of work is a, a rupture of the spatio-temporal organization of microbes, microbiomes and hosts, perhaps also an architectural uh, uh, disruptive agent uh, in a similar way to the toxicant. So as a historian of science, it has, of course, always been my job to trace how scientific ideas and practices change. But what I've endeavored to do here is to show that the history of metabolic science is also the material history of the current objects and subjects of inquiry in our laboratories. Through my archival and interview work, I've come to a very strong sense that, that the very position of the scientist is, is a historically specific one. She is no longer seeking just to probe the secrets of nature, to understand how inert matter passes through organisms, but also, and very importantly, to understand how organisms pass through matter. And that matter, its kind, its proportion, its temporal arrangement is fundamentally shaped uh, by human industry. So we often uh, pass off this term uh, disorder uh, as a in, in passing metabolic disorder, but I think that disorder could be a, a key hinge point here for asking new kinds of empirical questions at, at the interfaces of his, history and biology. So thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, uh, Hannah. Uh, that's, uh, I do it for all the, the audience uh, which is uh, listening to you. Um, it, uh, it needs the historian view to, uh, to get even a biochemist and a molecular biologist and a microbiologist to, th to rethink issues. Before I invite uh, people who are listening to your talk to ask questions, so if you want to ask questions, please use the chat function, just write your name and then uh, then uh, you can ask uh, Hannah a question and she will um, answer it. I would like to start with your, the last few points, and uh, which I didn't think about so much before. But of course, we are all interested in understanding metabolic disorders, and that we are driven by diseases uh, to, uh, to understanding diseases, as, as you mentioned, obesity um, and uh, inflammation, inflammatory disorders, etc. But then you showed very nice, uh, a kind of a strange title of this uh, Sewell paper, um, Biofilm Harmony. I, what is harmony? Uh, but the key word here is metabolic codependence. So that w means, if I understand you correctly, that um, metabolic disorder is always based also on a metabolic codependence. And that's not only true for the biofilm, for the microbial biofilm, but of course the microbes are also metabolically codependent on the host where they are sitting. And the host is codependent on the microbe. For that reason, shift workers are maybe a real good model because they change the whole complexity. They change the arithmetic of the microbiome metabolic activity, but also uh, other host-specific organs. So the question is how, in your, in your view, how to reverse that, how to treat metabolic disorders in these modern times in that complexity? It seems not to be so simple that we just can reverse and give another microbiome because this is codependent. So where are your thoughts on reversing metabolic disorders these days? Well, I, I think that um, it may suggest um, uh, 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 a an interestingly different set of endpoints um, for an intervention, let's say. So if, if we see, um, as we do see in the epidemiology, uh, that um, the 20% or so of people in, our, in, in Western societies who do shift work are uh, at higher risk for metabolic disorders of various kinds. Um, and we, we want to figure out how to intervene in that set of environmental and physiological circumstances, then we could ask whether, you know, uh, having, having a, a good uh, rhythmic separation between sleep and wake um, is a, a better outcome to be thinking about than, say, blood sugar or, or those kinds of things. If, if those outcomes are pointed towards this understanding that we've begun to develop, that the codependency um, is, is often dedicated towards keeping up uh, a boundedness that is necessary for interaction, such as gut integrity, then, then these interventions or or outcome points that look at, at something like gut integrity in relation to these industrialized conditions may give us a better handle on a way out of those things. I, I, I feel just as an observer of these situations that a lot of the biomarkers that are in use are, are biomarkers of, of, of the endpoints of dysfunction, not biomarkers of any mechanisms of resiliency or those kinds of things. So it may uh, suggest a different, a different set of um, qualities uh, to, to look for and to pursue uh, as the ground of an organism that is functioning with good metabolic order. Thank you very much. I think I have to handle now to Tobias. Tobias. And do you have to unmute? I'm unmuted. Yes, okay. Fine, we can hear you. I actually uh, 
I do have questions, but I did not I did not raise my hand. I was going to ask them because there are more philosophical questions uh, in, in in the roundtable discussion. But but if you if you call me up, then I say that I'm completely intrigued by the implication that metabolism allows for um, a philosophical model, a descriptive model, where one does not need to distinguish, so to speak, between human reality and biological reality, or at the very least that it's a fence sitter. You can look in both directions simultaneously and you can describe human actions in metabolic terms and you can simultaneously um, describe um, um, is is difficult the effect of human actions on 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 nature but i mean i'm intrigued by by this concept of community metabolism and the concept of industry so to speak that would emerge from the perspective of metabolism so if you would now conduct industry not from the perspective of uh, let's industrialize biological processes, but this has nothing to do with biology, but where you would actually sort of try to biologize industry and think about what would a, what would an industry look like from a perspective like community metabolism. I find that in, entirely captivating and very exciting. Thank you. Well, as always, uh, I'm interested in using the the juxtaposition to ask new kinds of empirical questions and assuming that much of the audience is biologists, I've said, you know, perhaps we can ask different kinds of questions in the biological field, but we can also use it in the opposite direction to uh, foment uh, much needed innovation in historical questions. And so this area of the industrialization of metabolism is one of, is one of those areas. There is just this enormous and untracked um, production of amino acids, fatty acids, uh, uh, enzymes, uh, every kind of component of um, metabolic life is, is produced uh, at industrial scales in our economies uh, globally. And, and, you know, we just don't think about those biologically at all. We don't think about what, what impact it is having, for example, to be producing more vitamin B12 now than at any time in history, to be producing more of this amino acid than that amino acid. And if you just look at the market dynamics around lysine, for example, that is an enormously interesting um, historical and biological question. Coming back to your wonderful example of low dose of arsenic, uh, which seems to be maybe something typical on the, the American continent, would you see the parallel or identical consequences by, in Europe here, there is lots of low dose of antibiotics for the very same reason. Uh, and uh, so Marty Blazer, as you know, is uh, very intrigued in that, and we try to do experiments to find out the, mechanis the mechanistic details behind low dose of antibiotics is a growth promoter, uh, and uh, we eat that, and uh, so then uh, that may be the underlying cause of obesity, etc. Would you see that antibiotic, the low dose antibiotic exposure, at the same level from your point of uh, view as the low dose of arsenic, or are there differences? Well, arsenic is a very, very special element, as as many of you um, uh, will be will be aware. Um, in part because it, it's not that humans invented it. it it's not a, not a consequence of industrialization. It's the 20th most common element in the Earth's crust. And, and microbes have a long history, evolutionary history of themselves having a, a metabolism for the different arsenic species. Um, I believe that there is a new antibiotic uh, that's been discovered in microbes that live in the roots of rice plants. Um, that 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 microbes make um, that has arsenic as its key uh, the, uh, central atom, um, and so so I would not generalize from arsenic to other um, substances easily because because of this complexity of of, of 
of it. Um, but at the same time, I think what I've tried to portray is, is the, the heuristic for asking questions. Um, and, and we may, we may think that low dose antibiotics have a particular uh, effect in chase, changing the speciation of what's what's present in the gut. Um, but this is why I brought up John Stoltz's uh, and, at work because I think it's such an interesting addition. It's, it doesn't just look at at the impact after long term low dose exposure on speciation, but but really on the spatio temporal structuring uh, at uh, specific locations uh, along the intestine and the colon. Um, and so the, this question of how a low dose exposure changes spatiotemporal organization and boundedness, I think could be quite generative for getting at some of these things that epidemiology is sort of waving at us and saying there seems to be a link here. But if we want to know how it works, perhaps um, this perspective can, can uh, additionally add uh, insights there. I see some questions in the chat here. Um. General is, I think, the question. General? And Roberta. Uh, Roberta has retracted the question. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I, I found the Asenic uh, story super interesting, going back, to, going back to the history and also to the present study together with Metabolism. And uh, that brings me one question, actually, about those uh, weird thinking. I'm wondering how does a historian select or evaluate the thousands of publications on the same topic, which sometimes could be even conflicting with each other, but uh, still through those um, thousands of publications, you make you made a story throughout the history and make sense. So I'm wondering how or um, what power do you have to give this insightful and also uh, interesting story? Us. Thank you. Um, so, so yes, I will will agree, um, and I sometimes uh, say that I, I I really wouldn't recommend trying to write a book about metabolism or arsenic <laughs> because the 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 endless depth that one could go to um, is is a little bit disassembling. Uh, but yet we need to find narrative, right, in, in, in these things. And so, so I'll take your question as a practical methodological one. How do I do it? Um, and, and that is that I, I am always mirroring the historical work with contemporary ethnographic work. So, so scientists, just like um, uh, Thomas Pardue was talking about having a philosopher in the lab, um, an ethnographer uh, is someone who embeds themselves in contemporary laboratory work in contemporary science as it is unfolding and has a kind of straddling inside outside perspective. So when I attend uh, talks here at UCLA, for example, I'm, I'm listening um, both from the point of view of what, what I know the history of those concepts were and from the contemporary point of view of thinking about uh, of hearing those things um, from, from a contemporary perspective. And so by, by thinking about how concepts have changed over time and also thinking about how concepts have changed material things that have consequences that are now appearing in our laboratories and, and on our benches and those kinds of things, uh, juxtaposing past and present is the way that I've come to uh, focus on, on these particular matters of concern. Historians of science have always observed that um, scientific knowledge is this particular creature with a, with a moving front. And every time there's change in configuration in scientific concepts, the past actually looks different, right? What, it, what it's significant to know about the past changes as our concepts change in the present. So, so maintaining this kind of mirroring be between um, the past of science and technology and its present um, tre present movements is 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 a method there. I guess the second thing is just read a ton um, and listen 
a lot uh, with. We have the freedom, of course, uh, that perhaps people working in particular sub areas in sciences don't to cross between areas and to think across them in this way. Thank you very much, Hannah, for that nearly closing important statement, uh, which I would like to rephrase again. If I don't see more questions in the chat, which I do not see here right now, I think that's a wonderful point of closing these two lectures. Hannah, thank you very much. I think it became very clear that uh, only a historian of science can make us aware of uh, terms and of processes and even of, of uh, things like metabolic disorders to rethink them in a very different but meaningful manner. And we are moving biochemically and, uh, and uh, molecularly to uh, community understanding of metabolism, but in a very superficial biochemical level at the moment. So yes, coming back to Thomas Pradeu and now to you, I think the two lectures made it very clear we have to leave our box thinking and uh, we have to bridge uh, different disciplines and with your last sense we have to enter different arenas and we have to invite you and we have to invite Thomas to come to our institute and to come to our center and to talk to us more often because uh, only by that we really will get an understanding of the complexity of what we are talking about that. So thank you very much uh, for this uh, insightful lecture and uh, thank you for the people who took part in the discussion. And uh, we will uh, record that and uh, thank you very much both of you, Thomas and, uh, and Hannah, for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.